to see so many people joining, a few more still coming in. Um, prospective students, people who are interested in the subject, and also uh, I see some of our uh, existing students as well, which is fantastic. So welcome all, uh, wherever you may be. Um, my name is Tom Tanner. I'm uh, a reader at SOAS, University of London, and I'm the director of the Centre for Environment Development and Policy. It's a, it's a research centre, but we run a major teaching programme in distance learning. I'm joined also by Annabel de Vries, who's programme director for our Sustainable Development MSc, and I'm the director of our Climate Change and Development MSc. I presume Annabel's there. Probably muted. Hi, I'm here now. <laughs> so, um, in terms of what we're going to talk through today, um, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit skippy. So we want to basically embrace uh, the urban and the, 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 the relationship between sustainability and the urban area. And we're going to provide a bit of a background of a few key challenges that are facing cities and urban areas and, and the processes around sustainability and particularly around resilience, which is one of, one of my own um, research interests. Um, and we'll do that kind of basing it on some of the elements of our new master's module that we've just launched on urban sustainability um, in this last session. And at the end, we'll also provide a short overview of our distance learning programmes and the way they're structured, so you get an idea. So I will leave it to Annabelle. We'll talk a little bit about the sustainability issues. I'll come back and talk about, a bit about urban resilience and some of uh, my work in that. And then we'll give you a short overview of the programmes before a Q&A at the end. And we'll, we'll aim to keep it fairly short so that we're not uh, taking up the whole hour and precious people's time, but uh, leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Please do add any questions in the chat function uh, before then, or if you want to ask them um, in person, then we'll uh, have time for that also uh, at the end. Um, and we can unmute, unmute your mics and, uh, and you can ask in person, but otherwise as they come to, things come to you, please do um, stick them in a the Q&A and we can try and address them together. Great, so Annabelle, I'll leave it to you to uh, take over. I lost you there for a minute, so hi. Um, so I am the convener of the Urban Sustainability Programme um, uh, module. So I'll just be introducing some of the key themes that we use in our module and that our students are learning at the moment. I'm going to turn my camera off to make sure that we don't lose any uh, broadband width, so it should work a bit better. So. The first uh, thing we start with in our module is thinking about why uh, urban sustainability is important and that's what we'll start today with um, presentation and then we'll go on to talking a little bit about what we mean by urban sustainability, what the challenges and the key themes are and also some sort of ideas of how solutions can be found whether through global frameworks, local responses and also different ways of thinking about problems. So first of all, why is urban sustainability important? Well, it's quite a cumbersome theme um, and uh, it entails in, in lots and lots of different topics which are central to this field. It spans multiple disciplines and we need lots of different disciplines to understand it. So it's really interesting to have lots of different people from um, who, who are distance learners because they're all coming from lots of different areas of expertise and um, professions. So um, urban sustainability really affects many, many people. Um, Four billion people live in urban areas. Um, so it contains much of the global population. Therefore, if we are trying to address those big challenges such as poverty and inequality, we do need to be looking at how to improve conditions in these areas. By 2030, the figure of those living in urban areas will increase to around 68%. Uh, that's 55% of the global population. In North America and Latin America, they have the largest uh, proportion of people living in our areas with 82 and 81% respectively. And the number of megacities is increasing by 
around 2030, it's estimated that 43 megacities um, will exist, and they're most likely to be located in developing regions. And urban areas are in the unique position of being both highly efficient and effective with regard to economic growth, job opportunities, and healthcare and education. Yet at the same time, they're also the biggest contributors to green gases. Sorry, greenhouse gas emissions, and um, they can also be the most unsafe and unjust places to live. While much is written on the detrimental impacts of urban growth, and we will cover these challenges uh, uh, shortly, the growth of an urban area can bring many benefits to citizens and to the economy. The association between the level of urbanization and GDP per capita is positive and urbanization facilitates economies of scale and agglomeration. As you can see here, cities ex contribute extensively to national economies. Um, just briefly, um, Latin um, America's largest cities contribute 4% of global GDP, and across all regions, 23 megacities um, generate 14% of global GDP. Um, that was a figure from 2007. But of course, there are, um, despite the immense opportunities, there are uh, some difficulties. Nevertheless, people who live in urban areas tend to have higher incomes. Um, they have more opportunities for jobs and uh, better opportunities for health and educational services. Those living in urban areas can also have higher incomes. They can also um, benefit from uh, reduction in transaction costs for example, in trade and transport, rent share, and increases in output are diversity. Knowledge sharing and innovation have also been shown to thrive in, thrive in urban areas. Um, but of course, not everybody benefits, and not every, so I'm getting lots of beeps, not every, um, everybody sees the benefits of um, these, uh, these elements particularly in lower income countries where poor infrastructure can impede the benefits of urban growth for many. Other outcomes of urbanization are also thought to be the establishment of more democratic and more political accountability. And it has been argued that large populations in political capitals are able to put more direct physical pressure on rural elites. And the relationship between cities and better governance is an important topic for future research. But of course, there are real risks and challenges of living in urban areas and cities. Um, more than two thirds of the world's population lives in cities that are more unequal today than they were 20 years ago. The increasing population in cities has resulted in slum development, with more than 828 million people living in city slums. They experience various deprivations and risks, including overcrowding and insufficient access to clean water, poor sanitation. And they often live in areas prone to flooding and landslides, as well as threats of forced evictions. Despite there being more job opportunities, many people make their living in the informal sector. And Africa has the highest portion of urban informal workforce with low incomes and insecure livelihoods. Urban residents also face additional intersecting constraints. Poor housing and services such as water um, cause widespread disease, poor sanitation, and is linked to malnutrition. In many cases, these outcomes are the result of multiple inequalities. An example here is um, with food and health. 40% of people living in area, urban areas experience moderate and severe food insecurity. Although 80% of global food is consumed in urban areas, the consumption is not equal. And we often assume that urban residents have more access to food. But actually, the reliance on markets and the need for income to purchase food means that urban dwellers are more likely to um, suffer from price increases and market shocks. 
In addition, poor residents also rely on cheap processed food, which is low in nutrients, and this has long-term implications for cognitive ability and life expectancy, in particular for women and young children. And poor diet has um, combined with exposure to high levels of pollution and sedentary lifestyles has resulted in low birth weight of urban babies. An example from urban Pakistan shows that 35% of babies are low in birth weight due to under, um, undernourished and overweight pregnant women. Health is a further factor um, which is impacted by air quality which can be caused by traffic congestion, industrial emissions, or poor indoor air quality. This increases conditions such as asthma and allergies and other respiratory illnesses can emerge. But none of these problems are unique to lower income countries. And one example um, is New York, where, which is one of the most unequal cities in the world with one in five New Yorkers living in poverty. Here, um, Housing in intersects with health, race, and status of residents. Um, and it's studies of, uh, on children living in high poverty households, in particular black and Latino children, are disproportionately likely to be diagnosed with asthma. A third of all asthma related emergency room visits in New York were from children from the Bronx. And climate change um, is particularly important in urban areas. Cities are the biggest contributors to climate change and they're also most at risk from the impacts of climate change. Heat stress and storms, extreme precipitation, coastal flooding, landslides, air pollution, drought, water scarcity and sea level rise all um, are some key outcomes of climate change in cities. Cities make 60% of the global energy consumption, 70% of greenhouse gas emissions, and 70% of global waste. Sea level rise could put up to 800 million people at risk in more than in 570 low-lying coastal cities by the year 2050. So, how and in what ways can we address this? Well, you're probably most familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, of which sustainable cities and communities is one of the key goals of goal, goal number 11. This is um, the, the this goal pays particular important uh, particular uh, focus on the importance of the human environmental health impacts. Um, of cities and also it connects with practically all of the other goals. In addition to these um, to the targets which are shown here, there are also additional subcategories, sub-targets, which include the importance of linkages between uh, the urban environment and the other wider environment, um, as well as inclusion and integrated policy and the support for the least developed countries. Unfortunately, uh, they have been criticized, particularly um, the, the, the Sustainable Goal, Goal 11 for really failing to address the structural inequalities which are prevalent in cities. Um, and although these goals are agreed by national governments, translating them to city um, level decisions and plans are often very difficult, which can often have many competing and contrasting um, agendas. So various frameworks have been developed to assist cities and urban areas to transition towards sustainability. And we cover this in our module throughout all the different um, units which are all based on uh, different aspects for example energy and health and um, food systems but these frameworks um, are, are an attempt to guide um, cities to um, trying to implement the sustainable development goal number 11 um, and they all tend to focus on different aspects for example the new urban agenda tends to focus on cooperation between levels of government and stake, multi-stakeholder partnerships. It's very focused on strengthening urban governance, legislation and finance. 
Um, whereas the urban sustainability framework prioritizes governance and uh, fiscal stability and resource efficiency um, from this is the World Bank. And finally, the urban, the climate change and cities put forward um, their five pathways to urban transformation, which really focuses um, around mitigation, adaptation and risk assessment, and also focuses on disadvantaged populations and governance. Citizen action is another way that change can occur. Uh, in our module, we also provide case studies and examples of where and how local responses to urban challenges are having impacts and consider what lessons can be taken for that. One example of citizen action is the Coalition for Clean Air Initiative in Jakarta. Uh, but there are also others, many others, um, particularly from New York and Bogota, which are explored in our module. In Jakarta, several community initiatives have attempted to improve urban sustainability. The main challenges in Jakarta um, were, occur because of its location. It's in the, um, in, in the middle of 27 rivers. Um, waterways and canals run all the way through Jakarta. Um, there are canals that lead out to the Java Sea. And Jakarta lies, most of Jakarta lies below sea level. And it also has the highest pollution of Southeast Asia. So um, this particular action was brought against the government um, of Jakarta and um, for breaching citizens' rights to a clean and healthy environment. And the lawsuit was supported um, by petition to adopt the WHO pollution safety standards. Um, it, they did ev eventually manage to get a response from the government who promised to meet the demands from the lawsuit. So in our module, we do look at lots of different solutions in, from, from academic work to um, government work and also to many different um, local action um, and responses. And this leads us on to the, another key point in um, thinking about urban environments and the importance of thinking about these challenges in a systems way. And one of these, um, one, pro one approach to this is systems thinking. Um, and this is an approach to policy analysis. Um, and it's advocated by many practitioners, in particular with regard to food systems, transport and health in cities. And it also is very, very relevant for thinking about smart cities and how technology can interact, um, particularly in areas of health and um, transport. This diagram from Bai shows that the complex adaptive and open system, which is characteristic of the urban um, complex, of the urban context um, shows that how many different multiple actors and structures and processes are involved in many of the um, activities and relationships that go on within a city. Um, the systems approach is um, a useful way of thinking about how we can solve problems because in particular, it um, tries to seek how to um, understand the system as a whole the relationship between the parts and rather than just the parts themselves. Um, it comes from the premise that the problems don't occur in vacuums, but are often the unintended outcomes of multiple feedback processes. And in this diagram, it's really useful because it shows that cities don't just exist um, on their own. They're also related to rural and peri-urban areas. Um, for, for things like uh, food and migrate, uh, labor migration. And that can have a real impact um, and have often unintended consequences with regards to things like housing and healthcare. Um, so something like a systems approach is a very, very useful way of um, bringing to the fore the many different actors and perspectives, the relationships between them uh, and understanding where feedback loops can occur and perhaps more importantly, where interventions can have multiple, um, uh, can have sort of multiple impacts in different areas. 
Um, another example um, of how things are interconnected is perhaps looking at the current global crisis that we have today with COVID, um, where we have um, a health crisis stemming from a food system where changes in land use uh, have impacted the spread of pathogens to humans, having impacts on health and education and livelihoods in cities right across the globe. And linked to all this is the need for resilience throughout the system um, and an understanding of um, how resilience um, action in one area can possibly help or mitigate changes in another area or actually result in negative consequences. So that's a little flavor of um, where we go with our module and I will pass you it's a nice link to Tom talking who will then carry on talking a bit more about resilience in the urban system with relate with uh, in relation to climate change. Thanks Annabelle. Whoops, it really is flicky. Um, yeah. the, the systems thinking approach to, to resilience has really kind of taken off although it is worth bearing just how much policy and, and practice still thinks of resilience in terms of this just bounce back, get back to how it was, get back to the status quo. And that's something that kind of practitioners and theorists are fighting all the time because, you know, it's in a lot of people's interests to have things back the way they were as fast as possible. Um, and to actually think about resilience as more about how to understand these com complex dynamic systems um, to deal with that comp complexity and interactivity. Um, particularly how to manage uncertainty and to accept that uncertainty is natural, a natural part of these urban systems, and that we need to manage it rather than kind of tame it uh, and, and try and iron out that uncertainty. Um, and using concepts like having diversity in the system, having redundancy, so things like water supply, for example, ensuring that when there is a drought, it's not just based on one reservoir, so the entire city is getting it, it's, it's, it's drinking water from one source. Um, but there's actually a range of different sources such that if one component of a system fails, so that you can use that for um, energy systems too. So the energy in a city, you don't want one power station to shut down the entire city. You want to have it in blocks so that you lose some parts and you might actually have some redundancy in the system to allow that some failure, safe failure somewhere in the system. Um, and finally, the other, the other way that kind of uh, the new resilience thinking is bring in, in urban areas are really brought the kind of equity and values uh, to the fore because resilience in terms of the kind of ecological foundations of ecological systems and are they resilient to shocks which is where a lot of the theory comes from um, and equally in the engineering where resilience being about pushing something until it breaks essentially um, that's not really laden with values so if we want to include issues around equity and social justice they need to be embedded actively rather than assuming that and that's one of the major critiques of resilience has been that it it doesn't include those values and that it does tend towards uh, just basic bounce back um, so my own research and interest and some of the work in the uh, urban sustainability module is focused on climate change resilience and particularly the kind of disaster resilience but also the creeping long-term threat of climate change and it's basically on the premise that we've got a lot of people living in uh, very exposed areas, that the migratory flows that we see are actually putting, pushing people into, or pulling people into those more exposed locations because those cities are more dynamic, um, and but that generally uh, lower income migrants tend to be pushed into the more exposed locations within those cities. So you see the agglomeration of cities in coastal locations, um, low-lying deltas, and other areas that are really exposed to, uh, to, to climate shocks and stresses. And we know that taking action in advance is much, much cheaper than dealing with the losses, which were 73 billion just last year, of which only 20, 20 billion were, were insured. So there's a lot of loss happening there. Um, and you know, the recovery costs greatly outweigh the, the losses, and the losses greatly outweigh the costs of preventing those losses in the first place. So I've been working with a colleague, um, Aditya Bahadur, um, looking at some of this urban resilience work and examples around the world, um, putting it into a book really, and trying to kind of see where the pivots, we're seeing where the disruption is happening to the existing uh, patterns of, of risk and resilience. 
and suggest some kind of five key areas where major disruption is needed to improve resilience. And I'm going to just touch on three of them here. The first is around data. So the normal approach to data around climate modeling, around using remote sensing techniques and surveys suffers a series of real challenges, particularly because of the dynamism in cities. So if you think of a survey that's surveying, you know, who is in a city, first of all, does it capture the people who aren't necessarily citizens, so the migrant populations, for example? Secondly, it's a snapshot in time, so how can it be uh, more, more dynamic? Um, how can it be more certain? How can the data be more granular, be more, uh, more detailed at lower scales? And how can we show that these things are true? What's the veracity uh, of the data when we're using uh, modeling in particular? So we've looked at a, a range of methods that, have, that are emerging around big data initiatives and AI that tr really try and uh, tackle some of those challenges and that we really need to you know, look to in the future. Um, just a couple of examples. The use of mobile phone batteries to act as mobile temperature gauges because the battery temperature uh, is directly related to the air temperature and a simple app can actually communicate that to a central grid. So you essentially got a load of moving real time monitors of temperature, which particularly in terms in the context of urban uh, heat island effects and extremes is, you know, absolutely an incredible resource that hasn't really been, been tapped into. We've also been looking um, at the, uh, the Romani Huria uh, program in, in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where you have uh, a volunteer based geographical information approach. And there's quite a lot of these kind of map my street type approaches where you have people who are actively um, adding to street map and an open source uh, software to actually improve the flood mapping of the districts in Dar es Salaam because there's the granularity that you could achieve with the remote sensing, sensing data did not actually allow uh, the, the interventions to really understand where the water goes when there are different types of flood events and to actually be able to map that uh, on the ground so that they can better prepare for, for, for future was, uh, was really important and bringing that data, the sourcing, crowdsourcing that data on the ground um, through these uh, app technologies has been you know, a real uh, sea change in the, in, in the Dar es Salaam flood management. One of the second big pivots we looked at is the resilience of the urban systems that Annabelle's touched on already. And if you look at the existing approaches to urban services, they, they tend to, to be focused on sec different sectors. So it's quite a sectoral heavy focus. And things like um, trying to manage supply and demand. So we, we know that from a consumer basis, we can try and improve the, the flows of water so that we can use water more efficiently. Same for energy efficiency me methods that are on the, on the demand side. We've got a lot of uh, work to improve the supply side as well on urban services, particularly use of things like smart grids in, in electricity. Um, and there's a whole set of climate proofing happening within infrastructure and particularly critical infrastructure that is uh, predicated really on, firstly, this kind of infrastructure, infrastructure strengthening as strengthening of the physical infrastructure, but it has branched in also into the use of um, the systems thinking and how the, the different systems interrelate. So for example, in, in transport systems, you aren't losing um, an entire transport system when the power goes down uh, in, in one area of the city. It doesn't look out the entire system. What we've really tried to do, and I'm sorry that I had this as a, um, as a clickable PowerPoint. So underneath there is, we've really critiqued that approach from the perspective of capabilities, competencies, and capacities to say that there's a lot of work that looking at those harder systems approaches, um, that, that it takes a kind of hard system approach that's looking at the physical infrastructure, but much less that's looking to build on those competencies and capacities that allow the governance to work, to allow the skills uh, to actually be able to implement uh, a systems-based approach. And that's partly because, you know, funding, and I think politically as well, the, the hard infrastructure, the physical infrastructure is visible. So it's, you build a seawall and you're able to be accountable to, to people having done something. And these more uh, soft systems investments are much less visible 
and therefore harder to a champion and b kind of defend um, in terms of accountability. But some of the important examples that we then um, matched across the framework around individual organizational and institutional competencies were really really interesting just simple things like in some of the terms of references we found for um some of the resilience officers within cities having the space within there to take advantage of unexpected opportunities as they arise and also be able to deal with crises as they arrive you'd arise you'd be surprised how these terms of reference were like here's your job it's fully written out but actually unexpected things happen. That's part of the job of being, you know, working in resilience is dealing with crises, but also picking up on where there might be opportunities. So you can see the COVID crisis as a, as a place where actually if someone has space within their, within their terms of reference, their job description, they can, they can seize on the potential that uh, the COVID crisis and the response um, is providing to actually embed more resilience action in these structures. We also looked into things like adaptive management techniques. I don't know many people I'm sure are aware of these where you're attempting to essentially be able to constantly refine and revisit uh, the management plans and they become really popular in water management in particular. Um, the, the one of the examples from uh, Santa Clara Valley in uh, the US in California. Um, but also thinking in terms of those institutional incentives and how, how institutional institutions as norms and rules of, uh, of procedure embed or don't embed resilience so in india in particular look, looking at the um the devolution of power and authority where you have a, a process of decentralization but the power isn't being de uh, devolved to a sufficiently low level to enable people to actually uh, have the incentives to to invest in resilience and um, we also looked at softer examples around learning and how they move from didactic to relational learning so share learning dialogues where different stakeholders are able to come together repeatedly and build the trust and learn about each other's sectors and then start thinking in more um in more systems ways and the third uh a third area if I click this, a third area fairly briefly around urban planning so what we see at the moment around urban planning and what's built in these set of uh formal planning rules that are quite common and taught across the world. It's quite a you know, professional set of, uh, of understandings of how to plan in urban areas. But for resilience, we see real challenges with that because of the informality of many cities, particularly in the global south. So if you if you only have 30% of the, of the economic activity through the formal system, then actually those planning regulations aren't going to touch on the other 70%. So not only is it missing that informal sector, but actually it's, in, it's missing the potential of the informal sector. So what we've looked to is to, to try and tackle some of those equity um, challenges by, by looking at where the informal sector can actually be drawn on um, as, a, as an opportunity. So a, a whole range of examples there of how you can embrace the inform informality rather than fighting against it with formal planning regulations. So using informal knowledges, in, uh, particularly in informal settlements, We've got lots of great examples of self-enumeration, like in Cape Town, because the, the, the general regulations for citizens don't apply and you don't, the, the governments don't actually know who is living uh, within their own city, so it's hard to plan for them. Equally using um, systems of environmental observatories to solicit community views about uh, the, the resilience in there, and there's fan fantastic examples of uh, Manizales in Colombia, where by setting up these multiple observatories, they were able to bring consent, greater levels of consent around what the planners were trying to achieve and to bring in some of those informal processes. Um, there's lots of more, uh, I guess, instrumental work and technical work that uses the barefoot approach. So the barefoot doctors type approach in, in China, it, it was uh, from the 1960s onwards, but bringing that into planning so that you actually train up uh, people living in those informal settlements to act as planners and to feed into that planning system and equally as architects to start looking at the architecture and how a building might uh, might proceed and some of the work Aditya and I were involved with um, through the ACERN program was looking at the training of local informal builders so instead of trying to upgrade slums by you know bringing in some mortar from, from outside and doing those formal things actually training um, and working with uh, developing an association of 
local masons who were building using the materials that are regularly used in those uh, slums and looking at how those can be used to build in ways that are more resilient to storms and more resilient to flooding and to create that network of uh, the association so that people value the masons who are local but affiliated to that association um, and there's also many examples of uh, upgrading in situ as well around the world i mean in the, the, the favela barrio in, in brazil for, for years has had reversed this process of trying to evict people and seeing these as you know bad areas that need to be got rid of but actually accepting that they are part of the city um, and looking to up, have upgrade programs so that you improve um, the lives of people and the environments within those areas. So that provides a little snapshot of, um, of, of some of the resilience work. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar that resilience has become a bit of a, a watchword, um, but that provides a bit, of a, a bit of an overview. And I will let Annabelle speak a little bit about our programmes now by way of a short advert and then we'll take some look at some questions. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> like the short advert. Um, yes, so many of you will be on this webinar because you're interested in our distance learning programmes. Um, we have two programmes. One is the Climate Change and Development, which Tom is the director of, and the Sustainable Development, of which I'm the director of. Um, both of these programmes work in the same way. You've got a choice of MSc, but we also have uh, postgraduate diplomas and certificates. Um, the best thing about doing your um, any of these uh, programmes with us is that they're flexible and they enable you to combine your study with your work and other commitments. Also, they are run by um, our tutors who are experts in their field and a lot of the work that goes on at SEDEP, as Tom was saying, um, a lot of the research feeds into the way our modules are taught, um, all our modules are bespoke. Um, and so it's really good to have that input, which is continually being updated. Um, you can see here how long the average time is um, it takes, but um, I'll just show you the, the kind of um, minimum option, which is um, two module sessions per year. And within those, um, we basically have um, your elective, your core, which is taken first, followed by three electives. This is for an MSc. Between your um, modules, you do your dissertation, which is a little bit different to many um, other kind of programs that uh, you might have been familiar with, specifically perhaps your undergraduates, where you would do a dissertation at the end of your study. The good thing about this is that many of our students are, in, are professionals um, or they've already done a fair amount of work in the field that they like um, or they're really interested in a particular topic and being able to do your dissertation study after your dual um, allows you to um, get to grips with a subject that you're really interested in, start formulating your ideas um, and this happens so so then you will then carry on with your dissertation throughout the whole cycle of your MSc. Um, as you can see here, um, it, your your taught modules are interjected with your dissertation, finally ending with um, the submission of your final dissertation paper. So this is an average um, sort of time scale of your, your program, but we also enable flexibility by allowing you to drop out of a particular session. For example, if you finished you know, your dissertation study in year one and you weren't quite ready to take up your module number two, then you can defer that until the next time. Um, so that allows you a bit of flexibility and, uh, you know, depending on how, how your lifestyle works. Here is um, a, a list of some, well, of, of the core and optional modules on both the programmes. Um, so you can see how these are made up. There are some that uh, 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 sort of enable you to kind of cross choose, um, but the core is really the, um, Sorry, the core is, is really the directive. So um, 
in the climate change, your core will be focused on climate change and obviously sustainable development on sustainable development. So they both have slightly different angles. Um, but then, of course, you can take some electives from each. So you're not losing out um, and you're not completely committed to sort of only uh, sustainable development if perhaps you are also interested in um, energy. Um, so that's a, a short overview of our, yeah, I think, oops, of our programs and how they work. Um, so now we're going to just open up to some questions.